This presentation will provide you with an overview of how to apply the Welsh National Marine Plan. On the 12th of November 2009, the Marina Coastal Access Act came into force and provided the statutory basis for the plan-led regime to manage coastal and marine waters in the United Kingdom. Now that the Welsh National Marine Plan is in place, relevant public authorities must take account of it in their decision making. So how does the plan have effect? Under Section 58.1 of the Marina Coastal Access Act, a public authority must take account of any authorisation or enforcement decision in accordance with the appropriate marine policy documents unless relevant considerations indicate otherwise. Under Section 58.2, a public authority may take an authorisation decision otherwise in accordance with appropriate marine policy documents, but it must state its reasons for doing so. Under Section 58.3, a public authority must also have regard to the appropriate marine policy documents in taking any decision which relates to the exercise of any function capable of affecting the UK marine area, even if it is not an authorisation decision. The plan, as well as the UK Marine Policy Statement, are appropriate marine policy documents. Some organisations can have both the Section 58.1 and Section 58.3 responsibilities. Importantly, public authorities that have responsibilities far from the marine area can affect and be affected by the marine environment. All relevant public authorities therefore need to be aware of the Welsh National Marine Plan, UK Marine Policy Statement and comply with the requirements of Section 58 of the Marine and Coastal Access Act. So who will use the plan? The plan provides policy support and direction for decisions with the potential to affect the marine area and should also be used by both applicants and relevant public authorities who have a decision-making role in development of proposals and consideration for authorisation. It should also be used by relevant public authorities in making non-authorisation or enforcement decisions which have the potential to affect the plan area. Notably, any decision with the potential to affect the plan area, including those related to terrestrial activities, should be taken in accordance with this plan. If the decision has the potential to also affect another marine plan area, then it should also be taken in accordance with or regard to the marine plan for that area. Action is required by a range of parties to ensure the effective implementation of the plan, including developers, public authorities and other users. Key roles and responsibilities for developers includes engaging early with relevant stakeholders and applying the policies in the plan to shape development. There is a full list of key roles and responsibilities for developers on page 7 of the plan. Relevant public authorities are responsible for assessing whether proposals are in accordance with the plan in making planning, policy and authorisation and enforcement decisions. Again, the full list of key roles and responsibilities for RPAs is listed in the plan on page 8. To help RPAs understand their role in applying the plan to their decision making, we established the Marine Planning Decision Makers Group in August 2018. Please get in touch with the Welsh Government Marine Planning Team for more information. We are continuing to develop a range of material to support decision making, including guidance, case examples, evidence and an interactive planning portal. A governance report is already being produced and when available will act as a reference to describe which organisations have marine functions and where they operate. The Marine and Coastal Access Act describes RPAs and the different types of decisions these bodies may be taking. RPAs making authorisation and enforcement decisions in Wales under Section 58.1 of the Marine and Coastal Access Act include some of the organisations listed on screen. This slide gives examples of some of the decisions that will be considered under Section 58 of the Marina Coastal Access Act. Section 58.1 decisions are easier to identify and cover activities such as marine licences, planning authority, development consent order, authority to discharge or impound or extract water. Other examples are on the slide. Section 58.3 means public authorities must also have regard to the appropriate marine policy documents when taking decisions such as management measures, for example, switch between harbour berthing purposes, marine resource strategic management, for example, change in aggregate tonnage limits, and others listed on the slide. We are producing a report mapping out decisions taken by RPAs in the Welsh Marine Plan area. This will be published in late 2020 and can help RPAs understand more about the types of decisions they take that need to be made in accordance with the Marine Plan. The level of detail required to demonstrate compliance should be proportionate to a project scale, potential impacts and risk in accordance with policy Gen 02. Similarly, the level of assessment and engagement undertaken for any project should be proportionate to the scale and potential impact of the project and in accordance with any relevant project assessment requirements. For practical purposes, relevant authorities may consider it appropriate that proposals be categorised into bands to guide understanding of the level of detail likely to be required in proposal design and decision making. There are three categories of proposal types to support understanding of the practical application of this plan's policies for example, in relation to marine licensing. The image on screen is taken from page 11 of the plan. 
band one activities are low risk and little or no additional evidence is likely to be required to demonstrate compliance with the plan. Band two activities are medium risk. Some evidence is likely to be required to demonstrate compliance with the plan. The level of evidence required will be based upon the level of risk associated with the project. Band three activities are higher risk, including projects that require formal project assessment processes. A greater level of evidence is likely to be required to demonstrate compliance with the plan. Proposals fall into bands two and three should include a clear supporting statement on which plan policies are relevant, the extent to which the proposal complies with the policies and how the proposal contributes to the plan vision and objectives. The plan contains general cross-cutting and sector-specific policies. Sector-specific policies operate alongside general policies and relate to particular activities. Both general policies and sector policies should be applied unless associated policy narrative or supplementary planning documents indicate otherwise. The plan provides an integrated set of objectives and policies for the sustainable development of the plan area and as such none of the objectives, policies or supporting texts should be considered or applied in isolation. If to any extent a policy stated in the plan conflicts with any other statement of or information in the plan, that conflict must be resolved in favour of the policy. Where there is the potential for conflicts to arise between plan policies, decisions should be made on a case-by-case -case basis to best support the delivery of the objectives of the plan. Table 2 on page 9 of the plan gives an overview of the process for developing and authorising proposals of relevance in the plan. We have produced implementation guidance to support the Welsh National Marine Plan. It provides further detail on plan policies to help ensure they are implemented effectively and consistently and does not introduce new planning policy. This guidance sits alongside other non-statutory plan related policy guidance and evidence to support marine planning for Wales and will be updated periodically. The first version of the implementation guidance was produced in June 2020. This guidance should be read alongside the plan. Where there may be uncertainty over the requirements or implementation of the marine plan or any of its policies, decision makers should refer to the plan for the definitive policy wording and intent within the context of the overall plan. The introductory section covers things that are relevant to all proposals, decisions or policies. It has sections on the role of RPAs, information on preparing a proposal, how to apply the plan policies and terminology used throughout the plan and the implementation guidance. There's a chapter for general policies and a chapter for sector policies. Each policy is addressed in turn with specific guidance relevant to that policy area, including things to consider in preparing and determining a proposal. At the end, there is a glossary which includes a list of definitions for terms used in the marine plan and the implementation guidance. The implementation guidance makes it clear that it should be read in conjunction with the plan and that it does not introduce new policy. Let's take a further look at some of the chapters in detail. The introductory chapter considers the application process for developing and determining proposals and gives process diagrams. On the slides is an example which shows a method of policy screening showing the sequential process of reviewing and identifying policies relevant to a proposal and the effective screening out of policies which are not relevant. It also considers the use of proportionality in this process highlighting that a proportionate approach should be applied in determining the evidence to be provided for individual policies in relation to a specific decision, together with the consideration of scale, type and location of the proposal, along with the level of risk posed. There is a section on terminology which goes into detail on the avoid, minimise, mitigate decision hierarchy here, providing definitions of each of the terms and examples for each one. In applying the hierarchy, the focus should be to exhaust the possibilities of one level before progressing to consideration of the next. Proposals should seek to address any identified adverse impacts through firstly considering avoidance measures and only progressing through the hierarchy to minimisation and then to mitigation measures where achievement at the previous stage in the hierarchy can be demonstrated to not be realistically possible or fully adequate. Under this section, the implementation guidance also discusses other relevant terms in more detail, including the meaning of significant adverse impacts, considering this in a general policy context and in a sector policy context separately, presenting a clear and convincing case for proceeding under a policy and what that means in terms of what we would expect applicants to include with any justification. Exceptional circumstances relating to sector safeguarding policy going into what would be considered under a case for exceptional circumstances, assessment of impact on existing use, social, economic and environmental considerations, and providing a list for applicants and decision makers of what should be included in any consideration of this kind. Encouraged, where policies include encouragement for proposals which can positively contribute to the achievement of relevant marine plan and sector objectives, 
offer proposals which include an aspect of enhancement. The guidance goes into more detail of what would be expected under this aspect for policy and where this might come into play. And displacement. The guidance discusses where this comes into play and the considerations that will relate to this, including suggested methods to avoid, minimise or mitigate impacts of displacement. Each of the general policies is addressed in turn. For the general policies, guidance is split into two parts, policy context and general guidance, and advice for applicants and decision makers. The policy context and general guidance section contains information on who the relevant regulators or other organisations are, as well as signposting to other relevant legislation. The example on the slide, Historic Assets Policy, SOC 05, signposts legislation such as the Protection of Wrecks Act and the Historic Environment Wales Act, and for other relevant bodies, it gives the roles of CADU and the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales, their roles and responsibilities for historic assets in the Welsh Marine Area. Under the Advice for Applicants and Decision Makers part, the guidance covers individual policy-specific considerations for applicants to think about and include in their proposal, and the things for RPAs to take into consideration when making their decisions where this policy is a consideration. The example on the slide, Policy SI01, Risk-Based Decision Making. This is providing specific advice relating to adaptive management, listing the critical and important considerations for both applicants and decision makers when preparing or determining a proposal, which is to include some form of adaptive management. Things such as identifying early warning triggers and feeding back into future decisions. Similar to the general policy chapter, the sector policy chapter considers each of the sectors in turn, considering the support and safeguarding policies for each sector separately. Support and policy. Each policy again is a section on policy context and general guidance, and a section with policy-specific guidance for applicants and decision makers. The example on the slide, the aggregate sector. Under the policy context and general guidance section, it details where the policy applies, whether this is to the inshore or offshore region of the plan area, or both. It lists the relevant public authorities for the sector, and then it gives definitions for any sector-specific terms which are used within the plan or within the guidance. For aggregates, that includes definitions for what counts as a resource, aggregate reserve and rollover tonnage. This part of the guidance also signposts to other relevant legislation for this sector and for any other licences or authorisations which are required for different sectoral activities. Each sector then has a section with advice for applicants and decision makers. This includes detail on the likely impacts associated with activities under that sector and signposts to the general policies likely to be relevant to any application made from this sector. It then includes sector-specific considerations with different advice for applicants and for decision makers. The example on the slide aggregates advice on transport movement, tidal constraints and local development requirements. Sector safeguarding policy. This is laid out similar to the other policy sections. It sets up where the policy applies and in what circumstances. It also then gives any sector-specific terms or definitions and then based on the intricacies of the individual sector and likely relationships with other sector activities and potential for impact, it gives sector-specific considerations and guidance related to safeguarding for each sector. That concludes the presentation on implementing the plan. You can view further presentations on Marine Planning for Wales, including in relation to resource areas and strategic resource areas, the Marine Planning Portal, monitoring and reporting and an overview of marine planning. And finally, this slide provides you with a high-level overview of available resources to help you understand and apply the plan, as well as contact details for the team.